The PWHPA is coming to Ottawa on the Secret Dream Gap Tour, February 26th to 27th, presented by Sonnet Insurance. Come see Team Sonnet, Bauer, Adidas, and Harvey's face off in this four-game showcase weekend. Visit pwhpa.com for ticket information. The PWHPA is also super excited to announce that we have partnered up with Washington Capitals to bring the Secret Dream Gap Tour to Washington, D.C. on March 3rd to 6th. Come see the Team Bauer, Sonnet, Adidas, and Scotiabank take the ice in a four-game showcase. We will be there hosting three development sessions for youth, elite, and adults in the area. You can find all information you need, the tickets, and more, washcaps.com slash PWHPA. Again, washcaps.com slash PWHPA. Hello, hockey fans. This is the Noxie and Cax Show in partnership with the PWHPA and SDPN. We are through the preliminary rounds of women's hockey at the Olympics, and we are lucky to have on the show. You may know her as Sportsnet 590 fans co-host, creator of the A-List, but we know her <laughs> as former professional hockey player, Dartmouth and Ryerson alumna. And if you're Jim Jackson, you know her as Ashley. Please welcome to the show, Alish Forfar. Hey. hey guys so Welcome. glad to be joining you excited <laughs> yeah sorry we didn't send you the toucan headphones memo that's uh, yeah, that's on right <laughs> i could run off and get them i was gonna wear my mark and thunder jersey actually and i was like you i gotta should. dust that thing off no it's framed <laughs> oh. oh yeah gotta <laughs> didn't put that get in much the use actually it's like still got the <laughs> stiffness in it like didn't get much use but uh, anyway yeah <laughs> well like i said i feel like a lot of our sdpn listeners will know you from the fan but we know, we go a little bit further back than that. Yeah. So, do your do you think that your you know your co-hosts, your coworkers, and the fans really know the extent of your hockey background? I don't know. I don't think so. Sometimes I get people who are like, "I looked up your hockey DB stats, and you like you got like eight goals." I'm like, "That's <laughs> a little bit higher than I thought I got." But I don't know. It's a it's a weird world living in the radio sphere. I don't think people really know you that much. <laughs> so let's take it back to college. You're you went to Dartmouth right? 2012 to 2016. Yep. What did you study there? I double majored in English and geography because they, I wanted to do something in the journalism route. Um, but since it's like an old Ivy League school, they don't have a lot of new media platforms. So English was a good way of like honing down my writing, storytelling skills. And geography was more not like maps and graphs and like, <laughs> Ooh, this is a mountain. It was more, it was more like a, uh, you know, human geography, political geography. Um, so learning about like different countries and you know what they face and economic situations, et cetera. So kind of tried my best to create a journalism route there. Um, that's kind of why when I went to Ryerson, I focused on that second degree, which is sport media specific. So that gave me a good background, graduated there. And then as you said, went to Ryerson. I just love learning. <laughs> and did you, obviously you played at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. up, up, big green, or whatever you guys say there. Yeah, yeah. up, up, big green. So look at all the green go. behind me. Big, yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of it. Love I was going to make, I was going to make a comment. I was going to make one. <laughs> I should have worn green. Yeah. <laughs> Opportunity best. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, were you able to play at Ryerson while you were there? Yeah. So I played only three seasons at Dartmouth because I had hip surgery in my sophomore year. Um, so I redshirted that year, took the whole season off, but I stayed there because it felt weird to leave the school for a year and then graduate with the class below me. And um, there wasn't like a five-year program that I could do. So in that sophomore year, I kind of took on like the team manager role, like making everyone's sandwiches between the intermissions. <laughs> and uh, then I took on the social media role, which was super fun. Like I was like starting to learn about what it was like to be in the sports sphere, not on the ice. So that season was really tough to not play, but Ultimately, it gave me two years of eligibility at Ryerson to play. Um, so it all worked out. It was really tough to be sidelined, though. Um, but you know, my my class, my the six of us in the class of 2016, we were really really close. All six of us were Canadian. You might know Laura Stacy as one of them. Hey, and so we were like a little Canadian six pack, and you know, it just felt weird to to not be there for that season. So I learned a lot off the ice, and then you know, eventually helped me get to Ryerson to play two seasons. You know, since there, you're talking about off ice activities and events and stuff like that. I know a couple of people that went to Dartmouth, and um, I know a lot about uh, paddle pong and oh, yeah. a couple of things like that. I thought maybe yeah. you could allude if uh, sure you had extracurriculum activities there. So and you know what we humbly brag that 
Pong was yeah. actually invented at Dartmouth. If you look it up, I've heard all about in Wikipedia, it. <laughs> it's a real thing. Okay. So <laughs> not only are we intelligent and athletes, we're also very good at socializing extracurricularly in our evenings. Um, so we had, we played beer pong. Obviously people know beer pong is in, in Canada. It's like you throw the ball. Yeah. Dartmouth, you use a ping pong paddle without the handle and you like hold it around your hand and you actually play ping pong and you have to get it into the cups. So it's difficult even when you're not drinking and then add the, um, you know, the couple keystone lights in there and it is the best. It's the best. It's so much fun. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a, it's funny because people will come visit like your friends or even like my brother and you'd be trying to teach them quickly how to play pong. And they're like, this is so stupid. I don't want to play this. And then they're hooked. Right. Yeah. So that was a, a good memory. Um, many, many nights, um, learning how to play and then feeling like I had perfected it. And then now when we have reunions, I'm like, I am a oh, God awful at this. Like, <laughs> what are we doing? You, it's a skill you easily lose. I'll tell you that. But yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun at Dartmouth. I'll tell you that. It's good balance. And cool. I want to know about too, like the, the sisterhood. Yes. You might call it. We have. Yes. Okay. I knew this was coming. I yeah, should you have just known I was going to get right into it. Um, <laughs> so another thing about Dartmouth is that the only social life we don't have bars. There's, it's a very small, it's Hanover, New Hampshire, I think population like a thousand. So there's no like, you know, local watering hole you go to. Everybody is in a frat or a sorority. Like that's it. I think it's like 90% of the student body is in a sorority or frat. So everybody on our hockey team was in different sororities and everyone on the men's team was in the one frat. And like every frat had, you know, the football frat, the baseball frat, hockey frat. So all of us were in sororities. Yes, I was in a sorority. Um, ca <laughs> Kappa Kappa Gamma. So happy that Whoa. I am. A. That's it. <laughs> Yay. I love um, it. Yes, I, I was, was in Kappa this. Kappa Gamma. You know, Stace was in Tri Delta and they had like the three triangles. Yeah. So everyone ha was in one. And it's funny because it, before, high, like before college, I would have been like, uh, because you see what it looks like when you watch like House Bunny and all these shows, but it was That's actually exactly one of, what I was picturing. Yes, I know you are, and I know everyone <laughs> listening is probably thinking that, but it was the most low key, um, hilarious, just a way to meet people outside your uh, your regular social circle, which for me was the hockey team. Yeah, I made a lot of really great friends, and it was nothing like it is in the movies. We would wear like hilarious costumes. Like I would show up to the frat in a Teletubby costume. Like it was just like. <laughs> You didn't care, you know, you weren't wearing like the house bunny, like mm, I'm in a sorority. Like I, I actually like would have more fun just like dressing up like a clown and going out and like, it was a really fun atmosphere. And I think it was a great way to have a social life um, outside of the teams, like meeting different circles of people. But yes, we were in sororities and we have the sisterhood that will never die. <laughs> You have that for life, right? For life. Yeah. Oh, They're my sisters for life. Yeah. And if I was in the airport and I saw someone with like a KKG bag, I could go up. We have a secret handshake. I could say <laughs> our secret what? code word. They would know that I'm a Kappa. Oh, this is. This. I could get a job one day because someone was a Kappa and they want to hire me. Honestly, there's a That's lot of benefits deep. to it. Okay. Yeah. Do you put it <laughs> in your, on your resume? Do you like literally if I was applying for a job in the United States, like it's yeah. so much different here living in Canada, yeah. like nobody cares. Nobody knows anything about this. Mm -hmm. Even when I say I went to Dartmouth, they're like, oh, Dartmouth, Nova Where's Scotia. That? Eh? <laughs> I'm like, no, and, like the one in the States, like the good yeah. one. Um, <laughs> I mean, that was I mean, <laughs> um, but like a lot of my friends um, that live in the United States, like they live in New York, Chicago, wherever. Yeah, like, that's actually a really big social circle. There's alumni event it's really good networking like i know a lot of friends are like hey i got an interview at morgan stanley because i was a kappa and someone i know was a kappa mm -hmm. and like there's like they help each other whatever but i really haven't found a benefit of it sadly up in canada because it's not a big sorority life um right yeah we'll see maybe one day if i ever have a daughter she would be a legacy so she right. would she and would you would be a house mother <laughs> Yes. Is that how that works? Yes, I would be the house mom. <laughs> um, but if I ever had a daughter, she could be a Kappa. She could be my legacy. We'll see. That's a little wow. bit down the road, but very this fun. Is a mix of like all movies, right? Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> Honestly, and yeah. Bunny and did you pledge? You had to I pledge did, too. Yes, right? you have to pledge. Uh -huh. um, okay, I'll I'll expose myself. So, yes. pledging pledging is like uh, the most crazy thing you do. It's like a two week process. You do like night after night of these intense, like meeting and greeting and things. 
And then when you're finally, you select your house and they, or that you're, yeah, you're sorry to your house. They select you back, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. It's, it's so intense. Um, you do, you do like a week of pledge duties and it's not as bad. Like the frats get like legitimate, like lawsuits about it. Like there's really bad things that happen to fraternity brothers. The girls, it's more like, no, you gotta, you gotta wear like a really ugly outfit and like put your hair in pigtails. Like, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's one you can, uh, the girls couldn't walk on the grass in like, yeah. on campus. <laughs> right. So like you just have stupid to things. Every, yeah. Just you stupid can't walk in the middle. Things. You gotta yeah. paint your nails, yeah. different colors. But the, my senior year, I, ran for pledge mom and i got selected to be pledge mom so i was in charge of all the new newbies oh i had some fun <laughs> i had some fun with that it was really fun it was oh so cool God. like to meet them because they'd be two years younger than me at that point and i was like their pledge mom right me and another girl reed uh we had a blast so that's amazing we won't get into that that's for another time but it that's... was really fun it wasn't like rookie initiation but a little no. bit like that <laughs> right so speaking of leaving a legacy <laughs> on a slightly more serious note, yes. <laughs> um, in your senior year at Ryerson, you mm. were part of a group. This was your senior project. And you guys did a documentary style film called The Dream Gap. Um, featured players that you may have heard of, mm -hmm. like Mary Philip Plan, Hillary Knight, um, tons of people in there. Yeah. So talk us through a little bit about why kind of that was such a pivotal time for you to create that. Mm -hmm. And obviously you had vested interest because you were part of the Mark and Thunder at the time. Right. And just kind of talk, mm -hmm. like tell our audience a little bit about what, what that's about. Mm -hmm. Right. So I mentioned briefly that I got to play two seasons at Ryerson, which were awesome. Um, a big culture cha change for me playing in the NCAA and coming to play U sports. I had really like really successful two years there. Afterwards, I helped coach the team a bit for that next season. But that season, I was also playing my first year in the CWHL. And so kind of juggling all those things at once, um, trying to get into a sport media role, also being a player, also thinking, okay, my hockey career, you know, where am I going to go with this? The league folded. And that was really tough as a first year player who really didn't get my feet really underneath me, um, didn't get much opportunity to like sink into what it meant to be a professional hockey player. But all I knew is that I really I respected the women before us that had built that league. And I could see how impactful it was when I was at a game. You know, I wasn't doing much on the ice, but afterwards, it would be so great in the lobby just to talk to like young girls and, to, and, and young boys that came and like to see how important that was for them. So when the league folded, I just felt like I wanted to try to help tell the story of what the players were trying to do in that in that year there. So in your senior year at Ryerson, um, in the sport media program, you do something called practicum and you are literally given a, a blank slate and you can do whatever you would like sports related, tell some sort of story. So I, I was, I created a group and I was the producer of this storyline that I thought was really important. And I, and I handpicked some really incredible people to work with, um, videographer, editor, et cetera. And I said, guys, I really want to tell the story of the, what the PWHPA is, what they're doing, because nobody really is there to tell that story yet. And I have the access to just be like, hey, hello, Poulen, you know me. Um, do you want to <laughs> interview with me? Like, hee hee. And she's like, sure. And, you know, I, I just had a little bit of more of an access than a traditional broadcaster that wouldn't have like the personal relationships with. And also at that time, I feel like the girls were wanting to have their voice accurately represented and sometimes yeah. that's difficult in traditional media because it's like looking for a quote right and and i even like when we talk as athletes like we talk like we, you know we're bros <laughs> but when i when i even when i interview people there's just like it's almost like a wall is put up sometimes because sometimes we're, we're represented we're saying something and it's taken the wrong way yeah long story short i thought let's tell a story about the pwhpa let's go down to the chicago showcase let's go to the toronto showcase these are the first two ones um and try to like get in the space of what it's like um, we only had student budget our own money like we had to do this on our own we had no assistance um, in terms of like sponsors or anything but i had the pwhpa and all my connections and it was really probably one of the most mm, proud moments in my like short career of something that I, I did that I felt really made a difference. Um, and we had a big screening night in January when the project had done and was finished and, and we made it into a whole night with a panel of, of guest speakers. 
of athletes, like, you know, professional athletes like yours truly up on the stage. Um, and then we had people like with PhDs in sports and in, um, you know, women's rights issues. And we had like just such a great conversation, which is also was turned into a podcast that people could listen to. And we made this whole night, a whole celebration about it. And yeah, the, the documentary is only like a 20 minute long documentary. Like, you know, we didn't, we weren't making a Netflix series there, but I just think it really tapped into the players, their message, you know, what it meant to, to start fresh and to have this passion. Um, and I wish it's something I could continue, you know, now in my current role, I don't have the, the time or the effort available to do something like that, but it just was a snippet of what could be like if they did a netflix like f1 that f1 drive to survive yeah. that i'm obsessed with yeah. imagine they did that for just a you know one year and followed around the pwhpa and like saw what people were doing so that was like my baby attempt at that and i'm still really proud of it and i think it's you know you can still watch it and it's still available even though it's a couple of years now but it shows exactly that starting moment of like what it meant to create that momentum yeah and i think you you actually grasped everything and the voice of the players and how and mm -hmm. why and where it was going and how much it affected us when to see them kind of folded and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you alluded to it, but not really, but how was it to work also with Billie Jean King? Like you got to sit down right. with her. Oh my God. I just got icon, chills. Right. Okay. There yeah, it goes. Like, it, oh, yeah. So that happened on such a whim. We wanted to have, you know, we had Jaina, obviously a very important voice. Um, we had the players and it was like, we're missing somebody that's been through this, like someone that can be like, Hey, I've done this. Right. And Billie Jean King is like the pinnacle of that in sports and women's sports, especially. So somehow I was just like the greediest little, like hungriest person in the emails, like Billie Jean, Billie Jean. <laughs> Squeaky wheel. You know? Yeah. I'm just like <laughs> squeezing my way in there um, and found a way that we would go to Chicago on our own dime, um, rent a car, all of us drive down there and go to the Chicago showcase with the idea that we would get a 10 minute interview with Billie Jean King. Like I was like, I will do, I will take a train there. I don't care. So we get the opportunity to interview her and God, like I can feel my voice even shaking a bit because it was just so special. You know, I wasn't even a tennis person growing up. doesn't matter. Like, you know, who Billie Jean King is and you know what she's done for women's sports in general. So we got a chance to sit down with her um, just in the like boardroom of the, at the Chicago showcase tournament where like the Blackhawks practice. She was amazing. She was so cool. Like, <laughs> And it was funny because I came in like, it's like one of my biggest interviews. I'm like a young, like 25 year old, no, 23 year old. That's like never interviewed <laughs> anyone. And I have like my notebook and I had like a line of questioning. I asked her one question. I think she went on for 10 minutes. Like it just like went on and I'm just sitting there like, just oh my it. God, just like spewing knowledge and spewing experience. And like, you know what, this is what it's like to be in this moment. And this is what it means for the girls. And this is what they need. This is why it worked for me. And like, I was just like listening, like, wow, I could just like, I want this to be blasted on the radio. I want people to hear this. I want people to understand like it is doable. She knows, she knows it's hard work, but like there is a process to it. So amazing yeah. experience. Um, I have a photo with her after us. Can I get a photo with you about like Cute. your literal fan girl? Well, um, you're, you're one up on me because I still haven't met Billie Jean King and I've been working Come with on, for are you like serious? three years. So. I'll send you the photo. We can Photoshop your face in there. Drop me in. Yeah, okay. that's perfect. No, we, like you stay in the picture, but yeah. <laughs> perfect. We'll, we'll you can be, be on the together. other side. Yeah. Uh, she's so great. But yeah, that was a really awesome moment. Um, and just to, to see how much she believes in the PWHPA yeah. as well. Sometimes you have people like, oh yeah, they're going to do great. Like go for it. But she's invested in the actual success and, and wanting to be a part of that story. So just yeah, uh, God, it was so so cool. I, I I haven't thought back about it for a while, but those are one of those career moments that you're like, wow, that's pretty awesome. Like I got to interview <laughs> Billy Bean King, so that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And then the fact that you said she's invested, I think I think that's why we believe it so mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. too. Yeah, like she's she's directing and and allowing us mm -hmm. to believe even her, more. I just love her. <laughs> her and like her partner, Alana Kloss, is oh, like an advisor to mm -hmm. the PWHPA board. And they're both just incredible people. And I remember Billy Jean, like in one of our first meetings saying, you know, history seems so fast when you read about it, but it takes forever when you're creating it. Yeah. And that's like kind of a motto that's just kind of stuck with us, you know, at the mm -hmm. board level, but certainly I think trickled down to the players is like, Hey, you're trying to change history here. This isn't going to happen overnight. And that patience is grueling sometimes, but it's, it's also, it's also like, really humbling. Like she said that to me as well, when she was talking, 
because she goes, you look through it and like all of a sudden things change, but like you have to grind it out. And it's like, yeah. okay, sometimes it's easy to feel like overwhelmed by the process. Right. And if you're, if you're a fan of women's hockey, you're like, where's the league? Like, let's go. Right. Yeah. And some, you sometimes have to think, Hey, you know, look at what she went through and look at what like the WTA went through and it wasn't overnight. And it is a good humbling moment to say, you got to put the effort in, but it's worth every minute of it. Right. When she, when she comes out the other side and can speak highly of it. So Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that statement. And she was very blunt about that, which is sometimes good to hear. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And speaking about history, now this is going to take a dark turn here real fast (laughs) because I want to talk about this Toronto Star article. Oh, okay. History. We have to talk about it. Combining we don't want to talk about it, but we have to talk about <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. Don't need to say the author's name. It's not even worth mentioning, but Where Toronto Star article basically says, should women's hockey be at the Olympics? I want both your takes on, mm-hmm. on this and why this is just so problematic in 2022. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can start it you off. Go I ahead. Think. Yes. Initially when I read it, <laughs> I think I, I quote tweeted something, probably not really that PG. Um, <laughs> I was pretty upset because I, that was my whole life growing up. It's like, I wanted to be an Olympian. I didn't have anything else um, ac- accessible for me. Right. I watched the NHL with my mom and dad and my brother at night, but I would wait every four years to watch the Olympics and I still, I remember having like the Olympic poster on my wall and like that drove me regardless if I made that goal or not. Um, and I know there's really millions of people, not just Canadians and Americans, like, but all over the world that also feel that way. And I've been fortunate to play hockey in other countries, to coach people from other countries, um, to travel. And it's, it doesn't matter, you know, like it doesn't matter where you were born. You want to be an Olympian for your national team. And I think just because Canada and the United States are the the you know the the best right now doesn't mean that that is a bad thing right i think it just shows that there's probably more resources more funding more availability and it's more of a cultural thing right now for Can- north americans to play hockey but i think it almost exposes that there's an issue right like i yes. get that it, there is a big issue so i i see your point obviously we're not blind to the fact that canada and the united states are probably going to be in the gold medal match for the next couple of years, but maybe we, we flip the script to say, why, what can exactly. we do to change that? Right. Like you look at developing hockey nations and say, well, maybe if the U18 world women's worlds wasn't canceled for three years in a row, it would be a great time to see those, those countries get a shot at the world stage. So it's not just as black and white as the author made it seem is that, okay, get rid of this because it's boring to watch. It's, that Canada USA game was one of the best games I've watched in a long time. And I think if we continue to show that type of athleticism and passion for the game, it'll be a different team down the road. It's just like, it doesn't Absolutely. same thing that Billie Jean said, it doesn't happen overnight, but <laughs> you need to provide the opportunities for, you know, Sweden, Finland, Japan, Czech Republic, all these teams to even play in the like, U18s. Like there's a simple rule. Yeah. There's Stepping a simple stone. thing right there. Yeah. Right. And, so, yeah. and that's the other angle, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, let's have other federation invest in their women's programs, right? So we have a perfect example. Sweden used to be third, right? Always in the mix. All of a sudden, boom, boom, they get actually funding, like removed fully. Mm -hmm. And then Finland actually gets to see their their women's uh, athletes for who they are Mm -hmm. and what they need and then invest in their federations. And now they're third and technically had a really good world championship once a couple of years ago here. They basically won with an asterisk. Basically yeah. Won. yeah, yeah let's, that's most people that aren't American. They yes, pretty much I think won. they won. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that call was weird and everything. We all agree. But to, to, to me, that's where the line needs to be or the, the angle needs to be taken. Like you got to look at, okay, Canada and U.S. have the money to support the facilities, mm-hmm. uh, the amount of games, and the pool of hockey players. Let's mm-hmm. let's know, like, that is why we have Canadians elsewhere, too, let's be honest here. But, mm-hmm. like, the amount of players that we can groom versus those countries, let's help them. And that's yeah, what, exactly. like, you know, uh, Hockey Canada used to do a little bit and have, like, um, I guess, tournaments or, like, summer events there mm-hmm. where they would develop players and this is what needs to happen and keep happening. Obviously, with COVID, with everything that that we see now, it's tough. And then worlds being canceled, they don't understand how much of an impact those events being canceled have on our sport. Actually, yeah. at like the ground, like ground level, like you're 
you are only under 18 for a certain time. <laughs> I mean, and yep. those are your chances to potentially make that national team once in your life. And then you get that removed fully under your, like, I don't know. Those are so hard mentally. And, and to me, that article just was a, like a flop of things. It's like, you look back at men's hockey. Well, obviously Russia was crazy good and was killing any other teams back then. Like, do we hate that? Do we, did we not like hockey? Yeah. Oh, like, let's take men's hockey out of the Olympics. Like, right? no, that was never the story. Right. <laughs> Imagine. And I think we, we did talk about it a little bit before we started recording here, but uh, Jaina Hefford and Alison mm -hmm. Fox, who Ali is, you know, one of my idols, I would say she was a player <laughs> when I came to Brampton. She's a lawyer in Toronto here, incredibly intelligent person. And they put their thoughts, you know, the pen to paper and kind of wrote an opinion piece. And that's exactly what they talk about is like, yeah. this is what sports is about. You have, if you have a team or two teams or an individual or a couple of individuals that are dominating a sport, the idea is like, well, let's, it's not let's scrap the sport. It's, mm -hmm. hey, let's get our guys and gals up to that mm -hmm. standard. Like, what are they doing that we're not doing? And for some reason, we're having this conversation in 2022 about women's <laughs> hockey again. Although I do have faith in our hockey community. I've seen a shift in the last few years, um, you know, of support. And I think that we just got to keep riding that momentum. And, you know, like what we're doing with the PWHPA, this is, this mm -hmm. is the whole conversation. This will come back because, yeah. you know, we create a place for the best players in the world to live sustainably and play hockey professionally. They're not all going to be Canadian and Americans. They're going to be Finnish. They're going to be Swedish. They're going to be from the Czech, you know? So those players will take what they're learning here, the resources that they get here and go back to their countries and improve their programs. So I think it's, you know, it's a trickle down effect. And like we said before, it takes time, but it's uh, yeah, it was an unfortunate take garbage take. In my opinion, yeah. the good thing was you could see everybody outraged by it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that stuff doesn't slide under the radar anymore. Um, you can't have a take like that in 2022 and not expect to be ratioed into the moon. Like it felt great to see people supporting, but also it's like, why, why is this even getting the air? Like yeah. who this allows is just an article? Like yeah. And like who <laughs> sits there and says, yeah, let's put this out there. Good yeah. one, buddy. Like, it's just like, come on, you know, you should know better, but I was impressed by the amount of people that were just, you know, shutting it down right away and pr yeah. providing insight to why, yeah. not just being like, hey, F you, this article sucks. It's like, hey, here's some statistics to why this yeah. is an old take and why, you know, have you heard about the U18s being canceled? And people like yeah. knowing their stuff about women's hockey, that was a positive thing, not just us that are in the yeah. women's hockey world. <laughs> not just us being like, hey, our feelings are hurt. Don't yeah, say that. like people <laughs> that <me>. actually <laughs> support women's hockey that are not women's hockey players that knew mm -hmm. why that was such a bad take. That's what I took away from it is like, look, there's a lot of people that really care about women's hockey that are going to be outraged by this. So that's a win. Yeah. So thanks for bringing them out of, on the Twitter yeah. sphere and letting them <laughs> have their moment. I guess that's a win. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit then about about um, some of the teams at the Olympics, because it's, you know, as much as we want to say it's a, you know, two pony race, it's not, there's lots of teams, uh, you know, that are working hard. One of them being host China. So they started their development in preparation for hosting the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I would like to say four, if not more than that years ago. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we saw it in the CWHL when KRS was introduced as a team and then the Vanky Rays. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, for those listeners that don't really know the history, um, two teams from China joined the CWHL. Um, they put in a big chunk of change, uh, which basically funded, you know, I'd like to say the operations of the league for the last, you know, the latter Certainly. two years. <laughs> Certainly. And <yes. laughs> they basically did like a North American combine and found you know, players, some with Chinese heritage, some completely not like no Chinese heritage uh, mm -hmm. in their lineage. And they handpicked these players, brought them to China, gave them beautiful facilities, like yeah. wow. world class. Yeah. We got to play there. And I was like, you might just leave me here. Honestly. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah it's nice. <laughs> it was gorgeous. And they had fully staffed benches. They had doctors on hand. Like they had everything that we want in professional mm -hmm. women's hockey. So yeah. it was like, and the girls were making a, a good coin to be there. So give yeah. them credit. They put money into developing these players to represent China. Now, fast forward, we're in 2022. The Olympics are in Beijing. The Canadian born players that they have groomed, handpicked are now Chinese citizens. They've given up. This is my understanding. Now take it for what it is. My <laughs> understanding is that they've, had to give up Canadian citizenship to become Chinese citizens because you can't be dual in China. Mm -hmm. And we see now on the roster, they're 
given Chinese names. Want your thoughts <laughs> on all of this? Okay. Well, um, I think I personally, in the current cultural climate and social climate, would not be comfortable giving up my Canadian citizenship to be a Chinese national. That hockey aside, there's a lot of things politically going on in China that we don't need to get into, but I would not be comfortable with that. I was unaware that that was a specific criteria to play. Um, I know that other countries have been able to, you know, you find your lineage. You know, my grandmother was Finnish. I could have been figuring out how to get on the Finnish team. I didn't realize that it was like you're one or the other. You know, you can't be on both sides. So I wonder how that impacts after this tournament for them. That's the question for me. It's obviously an incredible experience to go to the Olympics. Like I would love it. I would do it. But with the idea that you lose your Canadian citizenship to play in this tournament, um, that to me, it's a, it's a big it's, decision. It's a no for me. Yeah. It's a big decision. And I think <laughs> the impact of it moving forward is what makes me a little anxious. Like we've seen yeah. Canadians detained in China for years. And like, I mean, not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying there's like, there's not always the greatest relationship between China in North American countries. So yeah. all the best to them. Not for me. <laughs> well, the, the, you know, they scored a goal. So I think they're on a positive side True. of things, right? That's so right. <laughs> might be best to they will let them come back. Yes. But no, I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, even when they first joined the CDAB, I'm pretty sure they mm -hmm. were already kind of talking about, Hey, in four years, you could potentially, you know, play mm -hmm. for China because you've been playing here for like mm -hmm. three to four years and you would get your, It was at the time, I think they were saying like, um, like, what is it? Permanent resident type of right. like yeah. thing. I never heard of like giving up my like citizenship fully um, or from anyone else that were there, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I, I think that's a huge commitment, uh, yeah. but again, beyond hockey, um, we all dream to make or to go to the Olympics. So at times like there's for sure thoughts that I was like, Hey, I wish I was like from France or I wish I had some kind of background and like for the Swiss team or however mm -hmm. that is. And you join, I'm a little bit skeptical with the, I don't know if I would have joined the Chinese team, but I understand why mm -hmm. yeah, they did it. If they were solely focused on, you know, hockey and I want to be at the Olympics and I want to like li live that dream type of thing. And who knows, maybe they have a bit right. more information than we don't have. I would hope they do. That's but. what I was just going to say. Like, feel free to fact check me on that. And also yeah. like full faith that, I mean, they probably have agents that they work with, like, you know, Canadian embassy agents that mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody's overseeing this. Like, this is not just a knee jerk, like, Hey, sign this piece of paper. And you know, <laughs> you're and, now yeah. Chinese. Yeah. yeah like that. There's, it a definitely runs a lot deeper than that. Um, but it is interesting. I think the it's logic cool of it makes sense. So I, 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 I agree with what you're saying. I think that's exactly how I've taken it as well in my tiny broadcasting career is that I think that that's accurate. Yeah. Um, so if that is the case, we will see how it plays out down the road. Like if you want to come back and live in Canada for the rest of your life, like how does, how, how does, does it work? work? I don't, I don't yeah. know. So and the, the other interesting thing info. was Kimberly Newell, who was a yes. uh, Canadian born. Mm -hmm. um, she was asked, she was interviewing after the game i believe and mm -hmm. she speaks uh Cantonese, mandarin. mandarin yeah <laughs> and so she was able to answer questions and then somebody was asking her a question in english and mm -hmm. basically her her aide or whoever was you know there supervising her was like no 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 you don't speak english so i was kind of like taken aback by that too because i'm like well here's a girl who like has worked really hard is helping Certainly. put your team on the map mm -hmm. and you're like, you're not letting her speak English to And like, she's going to speak eloquently. She's a very intelligent girl. I think she went to Princeton. Did she, she not? Went, I played against her at Princeton. So I know her personally because yeah. we were actually at one point, like trying out for the U18 team at the same time. And, and she is Canadian. Um, so I was stunned to also hear that she wasn't allowed to speak English at the press conference because I think it would be really great too if you are a Canadian born with Chinese right. heritage to see that connection of this this girl who you know is representing China at the Olympics she's got also the sickest pads I've ever seen like the dirtiest <laughs> hands pads. down <laughs> yeah. I honestly like I like you I would, would become a goaltender to wear those like it was sick she had a crazy fit um 
And I just thought like, okay, like what do we, why exclude that opportunity for a young girl or young boy watching this with Chinese heritage to be like, wow, right. that's sick. Like she went and played and she like knows her heritage is, is Chinese and she went and represented her country. Like, ah, come on. And this is, this is not new. Like there, no. there've been, you know, probably dozens, if not more hundreds of Olympians who, you know, were Canadian or were American and crossed the border and you know, mm. now are representing a different country or didn't quite make it in their country, got their dual c- citizenship or already were dual and now are representing a different country. Like this is, this is not really a new storyline. It happens. So it's like, I, I agree with you, Ailish, like the, it's, it's the pride thing. I mean, you're at the Olympics. You, you're proud to represent the country that you wear in your Jersey. And the mm. fact that she was kind of taken, you know, the opportunity was taken away from her to speak about that in English. I mean, it hurts at home more than anything because we're like, hey, I would have I'm loved saying, to hear what she, her? I mean, I don't, I don't speak Mandarin. So obviously I wouldn't <laughs> be able to understand, you know, what she's talking about in terms of like the, I'm sure she's talking about the honor to represent China exactly. and like what it meant to grow up. And maybe she, she tried out for the Canadian Olympic team. I was like within the program when she was, and maybe there's a great story there about how she had to face that adversity and she found another way to live out her dream. But you know, unless someone's going to translate that and put it out in, in Canadian media, we're not going to hear that. Like, I don't see that floating around on sports center TSN because she didn't speak in English. So it's like, you're, you're cutting off that, that story. That's probably an incredible story of perseverance and finding your roots and doing what you wanted to do as a kid, just for a different team. So yeah, that, yeah, that bugs a, me. <laughs> maybe that's why we were all kind of like reticent to be, Oh, I don't know if I'd go to China. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a that's small a reason. Yeah. So yeah, it's one of them. Control would be probably um, yeah. a little too much, but yeah. And, and, and I mean, we're, we're talking about the host team and everything. And, and I want to elude, we were talking about a couple other countries and we're going to get to USA and Canada in a little bit, but um, I think there's a cool story. And, and actually Moxie, you found out a bit more about this one, but Denmark um, I think is, is uh a team one that surprised a lot of people uh, today uh, on the men's side. And then also um, will be surprising probably even more as we go, but um, let's talk about their, their sets of siblings that they have both on the men's and women's side. And then the hockey family, I guess that they are producing over there or something. Um, I mean, we've got what four sets, I believe. Four we, sets we of look- siblings. Yeah. yeah. And then from both. So, all of them are currently playing for uh, the men's and the women's team are at Beijing. Um, there's a couple that could have or should have been there. Uh, mm-hmm. If we refer to Frederick Anderson, but have we ever seen this before on any or in any like, other countries? <laughs> it, like other all I can imagine is maybe yeah. like the castles yeah, are castles. the only ones I can think of. And I believe they were both at the last Olympics or the last, last time that they could be there. Like I the can't NHL remember when was, men were in. Yeah. 14th. Um, so cheap, yeah, probably 14, probably 10, so cheap, know. you know. Yeah, but that is like that alone was like, oh my god, like <laughs> like North America was like blowing up with that storyline. Um, I mean, anytime they can talk about someone's sibling on a women's <laughs> hockey game, it is like, <laughs> hey, did you know that their sibling is a chiropractor and like the best chiropractor in Vaughn? You're like, nobody cares, man. But like, let's just throw in the sibling talk. And but, we're like, bringing <laughs> the siblings here. Oh, you're yeah, like. It, uh, uh, but this this Danish story is amazing. Like ah, uh, it is just it's you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow on my A list at six thirty in the morning when I do my A list. I, I this is a kind of a newer story that came out today or yesterday. I just think it's amazing. Like imagine how yeah. proud those families are and like your parents sitting there. Like I'm like oh, it's so so cool. You get to walk out there. Your brother, your sisters there. Amazing. That's like so, it's like, so cool. I, like in my head, I'm just picturing like, oh, they all grew up in the same neighborhood too. Like they probably just have street parties. They're like all oh, the same kids used to play hockey together, and now they're at the Olympics. Like just small town feels. Yeah, it's a great feel good story. And obviously <sighs> Denmark with a historic win over the Czech three mm-hmm. two. Love to see that. And like we said, this is a growing program. This is a, a program that this is Again. their first time at the Olympics, both mm-hmm. men's and women's. Mm-hmm. And you know, to get a first win against the Czech, and obviously showing tremendous opportunity for growth is a, say, a great feel-good story. Maybe this, maybe this is a plus on investing in your federations and your actual programs and players. Like here's Shit, a, here's an article that. to write about Rosie. Here's <laughs> another one. Hit us up. <laughs> and honestly, like that's how I felt about watching Japan during this Olympics. Like I have been able to watch, I have a couple friends that um, I know are in the Japanese hockey system um, just through, through my travels and my playing. 
Canadian yeah and like it, it's gorgeous. um and a lot of them are like canadian born with japanese heritage and it's been really great to see how that federation has invested in their players and i think japan got two wins at this olympics one over denmark and one over oh they they lost the shootout or to china which was really tight but they beat another team i'm trying to remember off the top of my head oh check so like that's a pretty great start for you know a young and upcoming team as well um i think that that's going to be something we see down the road is like them investing and them getting better um so i thought japan was a really good story group b was just like yeah, really fun to watch because it unpredictable um really close games really great to see these developing countries in the world of hockey getting a chance at the state at the big stage to play um i do sometimes think that it's kind of lame that all group a teams make it through so, yeah you know what i mean so, like, it is but it kind of sucks it is but at the same I mean, it makes time sense, yeah though. at the same time i see and i understand why and then the teams that are coming up too okay we're talking a and b but then there's france coming and there's like all these other like mm -hmm. top 15 fighting to get into the top 10 right and i mm -hmm. i played with a couple of french girls uh with the canadian and they were fighting like hard and almost made it there yeah. i wish they would have been but i i just think like again I think we're on a positive growth in terms of women's hockey in all countries. And I, it's good to talk about these and it's good to be impressed about Japan and impressed about sure. any other teams that's having good performances. I mean, the Russians played well against Canada. I'm sorry, but it was, yes, Smash was challenged. Mm -hmm. Like Emerson Smash Mary in that it wasn't that many shots, but she had a breakaway. She had a couple yeah. of like, Redirections yep, she, in front. She had to make saves when, when it came yep. down to it. So let's go to the Canada U.S kind of rob me really a little bit of mm -hmm. course there's a little bit of controversy with the russians yeah. and the masks and the covid fiasco we won't spend too much time there don't because... ever complain about having to wear a mask in a grocery store or something right. you just watch these olympians play a 60 minute game with k95 and 95 masks on and they still smashed right. russia so just don't even come for me with the mask talk people <laughs> because you can wear a mask in dollarama okay yeah yeah when you're just strolling around um <laughs> so where do you guys want to start you want to start with usa you want to start with canada hmm. you're the boss let's, let's go us first okay, okay. okay. Love it. um i was most impressed of course cameron easy and carpenter that mm -hmm. carpenter goal on the backhand yeah like that was an incredible shot mm -hmm. not like she didn't have time to think about it it was on and off her stick um obviously first period for the usa dominated canada well, that was a little nervous i'll tell you that biting my nails watching we there. all were <laughs> they were wheeling and dealing in the in the ozone for sure mm -hmm. and i mean there's i love carpenter and i love that you bring her up because she was in there in last olympics she should have been there in my book yep. mm -hmm. and if we go back to even the previous olympics she was a stud that was a playmaker again mm -hmm. able to like find players and now we're truly seeing her for what she's worth and what she's doing like she's playing with kessel mm -hmm. they set each other up really really nicely and i mean um camarizi is the speed on that line they keep the everything going they keep the pressure and that's what scares me for canada is that and renee did have to make some crazy saves here and there 51 of them exactly breaks a record right yeah. and at the time like it is one thing to like be in the game and there's shots back and forth, but when you're mm -hmm. stuck in your zone, Liz, let me know, but up, down, up, down for like no more thanks. than 30, no. 40 seconds. I remember um, we used to, cause especially when we played Montreal, we were on the PK a lot. <laughs> we were always on the PK. I Guys. don't understand. <laughs> like that's my only memory of playing Montreal is that honestly, like I, he'd be like, I was PK. and I'm like, I, this is the only time I get on the ice is PK. And I'm like, I'm finally exhausted for once in a game. And like, it yeah. was just endless PKs. Like, Jill Sonia, like her, just like uh, playing against her on the PK. I'm like, I literally don't put me out. Like she's going to embarrass me. <laughs> Please don't do it. I thought you were going to say like, she's falling and that's why you get penalty. Well, I was going to call no, you. She well, would be the one that would draw the penalty. You said it. Well, I'm going to say then, that Laura Stacy was doing uh, yeah, well, a fabulous job at that for Mark. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She's been like that since I played with Laura in grade oh, 10. Well, yes. Okay? We love she's, them. She's very she falls she's got you know the lanky body okay well, it's, it's just like, it's just the speed she's got so much fast. speed and then you Guys, it's like it's I like think when it's you're on rollerblades you know and you hit like a little a little stick yeah you're just gonna fall she's well you either go over the stick and stick no. with it no. or you just like oh i'm gonna trip hey let's, let's, let's go back let's go back sorry we <laughs> yeah, got on sorry, to the can i sidetrack <laughs> we got pk we got everything i thought honestly 5v5 actually is where the u.s 
was dominating yeah. Canada. Um, we have the best PK on the Canadian side. Power play wise for the US, let's go back to them, is missing Decker. Big yeah. time. Big, big time. Yeah. Um, I love Hannah Brandt. Know her. She's mm-hmm. amazing, but she is not the level that Decker brings when it's on the PP. And I think that's hurting them big time. Honestly, yeah. and it's it's the hockey IQ of Brianna Decker. Like mm-hmm. she is... I, I called her sneaky in a previous episode. She's sneaky. Like you, mm-hmm. she's not very big. Sharp she doesn't take up a lot of ice. She doesn't look like, you know, she's not Hillary Knight. You're not mm-hmm. facing off against like, you know, this huge like being, <laughs> but she, she finds these like soft spots, especially like on the back door, like quiet spots in the slot that, and when she gets the puck, like she just makes no mistake. And I, I agree with you, Cax. I think that that really is a spot where they're hurting, uh, missing her due to injury. Yeah, I'll say that I was really impressed with Carpenter stepping up as soon as the Decker injury happened. And I think it has a lot to do with not making the Olympics that last time and seeing it as an opportunity, like not that she's playing for herself, but if you think of it, like her and Bozak have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. They were cut from the last time around. They fought their way back to be on the team. And that's an opportunity to step up. And she really did the last couple of games, you know, losing Decker in the first minute or first game, you know, that's really tough mentally, but you have to kind of think, Hey, here's an opportunity for me. Like I'm going to be shuffled up a little bit higher in the, in the rankings and, I have a lot to prove. So I think she's certainly done that. Um, my biggest takeaway was from Canada is that I really think that the young D looked a bit out of yeah. place. And I think when you're talking about nervous. the five on five play, mm-hmm. they looked nervous. And mm-hmm. I totally understand that they played, you know, four games before that, three games before that against teams where they didn't have a lot of sustained pressure. You know, the D didn't have to make quick, timely decisions with right. Hillary Knight breathing down your back. You know, that wasn't as physical a style of play. And then all of a sudden you play in the United States and it was like, oh, this is this is it. Like this is intense. So right. I would say that the biggest weakness that Canada had and is something that's fixable is it looked like a little bit of jitters on the back end. Yep. You have what four or five new faces and never played in the Olympics before that are mm-hmm. young. Um that is something that can easily be focused on moving forward though. You know, maybe it's being a little bit more as a forward lower to support maybe yeah. you're not waiting for the puck to get to you maybe your center needs to be a little bit more aggressive in the corners to help but i thought that that was the biggest uh you know glaring thing that canada looked out muscled in their own end and and has to do with the young d i think yeah i and, agree and they they have to rely on those defense too because i saw the minutes that renata fast and jocelyn oh, yeah. rock like played more than half a game it almost. was like yeah it was three and nine and at some yeah, point is what i that's my whole CWHL career <laughs> <laughs> and, oh my God. and they played outstandingly. Like I, yeah. I mean, Jocelyn was blocking shots. Renata had that save in the first period where it kind of trickled through and Renee, like mm-hmm. we barely even talked about that. Like yeah. I was, I was rewatching, you know, the yeah. game the next day. And I was just like, man, like she just saved the yeah. f- opening goal. And we're all just like, yeah, that's just Renata doing her thing. Like just, <laughs> just saving a goal on the goal line. So it's true, but they can only play so much, right? Like you're yeah. going to need those young D to step up. Mm-hmm. And and again, like maybe like you said, it's uh, the intensity. They ju- they just hadn't seen it other than yeah. maybe pre- before Christmas, right? If we go back, like the rivalry, eh, yeah, the last game was December something because it didn't play mm-hmm. prior. So mm-hmm. maybe the next game is going to be a bit better. And and well, you I know think- what to expect now, right? Yeah. So like you're yeah. not going to yeah, yeah, be yeah, yeah. shell shocked. You got to know that the U.S. are going to be really hungry down in the offensive zone. So. Maybe yeah, I think it was having to do with what you're saying. They haven't played them since December. You know, you yeah, had to you take your foot off the gas a bit. And I don't know what it was, but the way they the way the US started the game, their intensity yeah. was like, Hey, Canada needs to match it. Hey, mm-hmm. hey, let's get let's get up there. And you know, I we spoke about her before, but uh, Murphy, uh, Murphy's line, Abby Mur- like yep. Kate, where it started. I think I'm again, going to like her. her. I, 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 I'm going to hate her. I'll tell you that. She is a march on so to good. Me. She is good. She's, she's bringing she's like, what, it. 19 or 20 or something. First of all, she's young and yeah. so, so speedy. And it was funny because my co-hosts on the morning show were watching the game too. And I got like three or four texts from them. Be like, who's this Murphy chick? Yeah. All I hear is Murphy, Murphy, Murphy. And I'm like, yeah, get used to, like that. You're going to be hearing her name a lot. And she just, for some reason, I mean, I didn't watch all the American games before. I'll tell you that. Um, obviously, during the Olympics, I've been more focused on Canada than sleeping. Uh, but she, <laughs> she was definitely like 
I had to sit there and be like, oh, okay. Like she has come onto the world stage with like a a vengeance. And I thought Abby Rock would do that. And I haven't seen as much from her as I thought. It was more Mm -hmm. the Abby Murphy show and less of the Abby Rock show, which I I thought would be the other way around. So I was really impressed by her. And I hope that she maybe tones it down a little bit though. Yeah. And Abby Murphy is playing also, you know, against the third or fourth line on our, on our side, usually like, you know, is in the zone. Her speed is something really good. She gets in the nitty gritty area, but the one play, and I texted Noxy right away because I've been talking about her and saying like, she's great. I just wish she wasn't as cheap as she is. And certain areas like, you know, she's pushing. I am one of those. So I can talk about it. I think (laughs) is, is I'm giving my own self real recognized. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, I don't think I'm as bad, but she goes, takes a shot and Renee makes the save. And I know, and I don't know if you guys all saw it. She is, there's a camera angle that just sees her. She's skating, skating, and then never moves, gives her a little shoulder to her the little, glove. I'm oh, like, I like that. She's, she's a little like a little rat in a sense. Oh, yeah. she's Marshawn. Someone, someone, was it you, Noxie, that said? She yeah. is like a little she's bit my NHL Marshawn. comparable. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking, speaking about goalies, because this is an interesting situation. Anne Renee is a clear number one for Canada, in my opinion. I think in most people's opinion, 51 saves against the, the Americans. The U.S. on the other side have taken a somewhat different approach, and they've given each of their goalies a start or a couple starts uh, in the preliminary round. So where do we, where do you guys sit on between Rooney, Hensley, and um, I always want to call her Rigsby Cameroon, Cavallini, Cavallini. Cavallini. Yeah, you're right. It just <laughs> makes the two names together. Yeah, <laughs> Cavallini and Cameroon. Um, I would. Yeah, you go ahead first. You guys. Uh... I'm, I'm, I'm pondering my answer here. <laughs> okay. I think it's um, um, to me and I, oh, this is going to be bad, but to me, Rooney has been over like over uh, she was number one last Olympics uh, overrated in my mind. And I think that Nicole Hensley has been in her uh, shadow a little bit and wasn't given a chance really at the previous Olympics. And we've seen her play against Canada this year, a bit more. Um, I think she's mine one. And then I'd go Rigsby Cavallini. Um, yeah. And then Rooney. So those would yeah. be my, my three. I mean, points. Cavallini brings a lot of experience, right? I, I was really shocked to hear that her start the other day against, I believe it was Finland. Yeah, I think her, so. It was her first Olympic start. I was like, this yeah. girl's been in the program since I started playing hockey. Yeah, they had like, better before and Scholes, right? They have better. Better was there right, the Molly whole Shows. time while she was uh, second or third when she came in. And then last Olympics, Rooney was the only goalie in, right. I think, the whole time, which was, anyways. Interesting dynamics. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. I would put Hensley first. Uh, I'd probably put Rooney second just because there's something about being young and excited to play in those mm-hmm. games, and not that Cavallini doesn't have it, but I think that if she's been on the team this long as a third goalie, she's probably bringing more to the dressing room than we mm-hmm. can see. And if that's her role, then that's a vital role as well. Mm-hmm. It's tough to judge because of the like the teams they had played in the round robin, like I think Hensley only stopped 12 shots against the Russian team. And like, I don't know how much you can really like take from that, but in, in watching her throughout the tournament, she just looks really confident. And like, I'm not a goaltender. I don't know much about that, but like being able to stand steady when you're not faced as much too, I assume is kind of like the whole point, right? Like you might, you might play against a Canadian team, team where like you had 51 shots on the other side or then you might play where you only have 12 shots but i think that she right. just looked really steady um and i i was interested about the united states approach like very different than canada like yeah, yeah. giving everyone a shot like i wonder if it's like it's kind of the tryout process too like maybe they didn't get as much looks as they wanted in the rivalry series like keep everyone warm back who on knows? that like and, and who also played in the rivalry series i don't remember at this point right like i don't remember yeah. it being a discussion point just I think they all did too. Very like mm-hmm. openly. Like I, I don't. Yeah. Like on it could our be, side, I mean, if, they, if they're that close, right? Like it, you yeah. just play, and then whoever's hot, it's, it's hot. It's kind of a good competitive thing too. Like you got to yeah. bring it. Like knowing that you haven't solidified your net for the gold medal game. So like, right. is that little bit of competitiveness, friendly competitiveness yeah. between the team healthy? Probably. Like I don't, right. Canada doesn't really have that right now with the goaltending situation. So not that you would feel less inclined to have a good game but knowing that you're confident in like hey i can you know right. what if i let in a goal or two by act like you know oh, i'm, I'm you know you're so, number one kind of thing yeah it's an interesting um a mindset for the americans they'll see who they play in the quarterfinals like check maybe i think it's check i think, I think it's so. check and then it would be like or even their next game wouldn't be like as challenging so it really comes down it's to like it's tough to stay they, up right 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's, we've given our American friends a ton of love here. Yeah. Let's talk about that. the Canadian gals. Cause we love them too. Yay. I'm well, going to start off hot because Cax and I, I think see differently on this issue. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go. talk about the Poulin penalty shot. You go first then. Okay. Listen, if I'm the U S goalie and I see my defense haul ass back, get stick on stick, stick, stick lifts her. Yes. Slid up, came close to the hands, maybe hit the hands, but Poulin gets the shot off. In my opinion, that's a penalty. That's that's my take. Just I, it's a penalty, controversial. No penalty shot. Like you're penalty, not even penalty, penalty shot. Okay. I mean, she. If you're gonna take a penalty shot, like if I'm that D, take her out. Yeah. Like take her right down. Make it worth it. Right. The fact that she still got a shot off, still had a strat on her. It's a tough call. Okay. That's my take. I appreciate okay. that. So take. I, I, <laughs> pre- I, I see your point with the. If you're going to get a penalty shot, get a penalty shot. You just go, you lay her down your stick, you trip her up. But I think knowing who the player was, it gave her a little bit of an extra. Okay. That's Poulin going on a breakaway. Like everyone's watching you. It's Poulin. Don't even touch her. Okay. Penalty shot. Also, I think both refs were Canadian. Um, uh, <laughs> not going to mention that one got her face <laughs> cut open though. Like that's how intense yeah. the game is. Even the refs are getting She's their nails. face cut open. Um, but I can't, I think. I think it could have went either way. I was very obviously pleased. You would you would let the call stay. I would let the call stand. Okay. No okay. bias. Trying to just remove myself from the situation. I think she did interrupt her flow. I don't know. The, I need to read the actual rule though. Like, is yeah. it? N- neither of us. None of us it, are refs. Okay. So There's, let's is, preface that. <laughs> is the rule like to interrupt the player's you know motion of shooting? Is it to hold them back from accelerating to get into a shot? Like, I I would love to know. But either way, I still think it should have been a penalty shot. Cax is just chomping at the bit. All right, Cax, okay, go so ahead. I think Unleash. there's a, um, no, no, I think within the penalties, I believe there's a situational or where the players are within. Mm-hmm. So if the player is behind the player that's getting a breakaway, usually interpretations is like aligning in s- itself with a penalty shot more often right. than not. So Barnes is clearly behind because the separations between the two have been yep happening which is crazy and how fast she got while not even moving was just impressive but that's another topic now she gets to she i guess takes one stride off gets to put her stick back into her hand that's when the hit happens Mm -hmm. so the stick goes by and then she's strong enough to bring it back let's be honest none of us would have taken that shot or been able to take that shot no i would have fallen on purpose So the puck would have been probably trickling down to where it's that goaltender and it's a safe. And then the penalty shots get to happen right there in your, in your explanation, Liz Knox. Now, because it's poo and she's good. We're going to tell her that, Oh, well you got it on that and you're too good. So you're not getting that penalty shot. So I don't agree with valid. The, the just a penalty. Um, I think Manta, who was uh, the referee who made the call, was actually in great position, mm-hmm. even behind the net, like facing what was happening too, and not necessarily on the side. So she saw it all. Um, Barnes was clearly behind. So I stand with the call that it was a penalty shot. And well, I'm outnumbered here, but I you stick lose. with my guts. <laughs> and, and the penalty You're right. When, shot, I, when I think about the NHL, like that is how I picture it too. If someone has a clear break and in is in directly a- ahead of you, not like sometimes it's like, oh, you're pulling them, you're beside right. them, right? And you're pulling them back. But she was clearly ahead of the, the skater. So that's, right. I think you've explained it perfectly. I, I'm fully on board now. Yes. I was a little bit hesitant. No, I'm fully on board. <laughs> I had you in the first half. No, yeah, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> One okay, argument. so again, her move it boils sick. down to, and, it yeah, boils down to Poulin's the best player in the world. Like yeah, there's, there's no question. Yeah. She's I mean, stronger, faster. She's the best. Mm-hmm. So who else are we looking at? Obviously, Kid Canada, Sarah Fillier. Yeah. Coming out with a couple of big goals. I mean, it's really hard to talk about points in the preliminary round mm-hmm. because, like we said, they're facing significantly weaker teams. Right. Um, been very impressed with a lot of the goaltending. I'll be honest. It's not an easy situation to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, so who you're you can't pick Poulet, okay? Who no are problem. you going to for your game winner? Jenner. I oh who'd you say? Jenner. Okay. Okay. I was gonna pick someone different. I'm gonna say Good, but that's I've mine. never <laughs> seen Natalie Spooner play as well as she's been playing lately. She looks yep. on fire. Obviously, she was leading the team in points and in the tournament in points as well. But she's she's just looked like 
a completely different Natalie Spooner since even from the rivalry series. I feel really confident that she's found this edge. She's being physical. She's fast. She's like so hard to play against, as I know. Um, but she she looks dynamite. She's making incredible plays. She's you know putting the puck in the net, but she's also setting people up. I feel good about her being at least in the conversation on the ice for that for that final you know overtime. I don't know if she's had like Jenner just, you know, two goals in that game. Like, that was generating momentum as I tweeted out. I don't know if I got hey, the love. She, love it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, it. Any of these guys, I will put them all on. I feel good about, but it, Natalie Spooner's <laughs> definitely really impressed me this Olympics. Yeah. I'd all agree right, with Cax, that. Jenner. Uh, yeah. Jenner. I'd agree with you though. Spoon is in the blue paint a lot. Yeah, and I think that's there. where she needs to be. Um, I'm saying Jenner because in the past few Olympics, she's always been there. She's always been playing as a center. And right now the duo Pula and Jenner is they maybe didn't really, you know, hit, I guess, the, or saw the back of the net and everything for the first few games, but the amount of little plays that they make and they do and the space that they create for each other or that third player that's playing with them, who's Sarah Nurse at this very moment, who right. got two go- the, the hat tricks, mm-hmm. the hat trick and the, the goals, uh, even at the last game. I just find them both really, really, their IQ level is something else. And yep. both goals she got yesterday, uh, two days ago now, um, or Canada, US, Whatever. whenever it has come out, um, <laughs> there is sticks. There was like a player on her or hitting her sticks and she still found the way to get it, you know, on her blade yeah. and off right away. That play on the power play was sick from Fillier, but the play also starts from pool and down who's faking mm-hmm. that pass to go across. So I'm just like, the amount of like space they create and the plays they see. And it's almost like three plays ahead of everyone yeah. else. So that's why Jenner is my pick. I Love think she- there's no doubt. I, I mean, I would put money on that. This is the best offensive team Canada I've seen yeah. probably yeah. my entire life. Bring Melo um, back. It's going to be seriously. She gets healthy and it's, it's lethal. So very excited to see how this one rolls out. Ailish, you're getting off the hook early here because we've run out of time for our trivia, which we were hoping would just embarrass <laughs> oh, your winter Olympic knowledge. But um, thank you so much for, first of all, sharing a little bit about yourself. I hope that our fans get to know you a little bit more. Oh, I hope um, they don't judge me, but yeah, <laughs> I wasn't a sorority Kappa, guys. Kappa. <laughs> what is it? Kappa? Kappa Gamma? Kappa, 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 Kappa. Gamma. Yeah, so hey. um, we know this won't be your last time on the show. Looking forward to having you back Absolutely. Um, from SDPN and the PWHPA. Um, you can visit pwhpa.com for all your secret dream gap tour needs and tune in on Tuesday. We'll catch up with one of the Cax's teammates in Montreal, but who you'll have to tune in to find out. Mm, absolutely. The Noxie and Cax show on SDPN produced in partnership with the PWHPA. Follow Noxie and Cax on Twitter at 27 Noxie and at Care LMR. The views expressed are those of the individuals and are not necessarily those of the PWHPA. Check out SDPN.ca for more Noxie and Cax and the rest of the SDPN crew. Frisco!